Okay, perfect. And Joshua, a great uh, lead off. So all of those drones, and you can see on those extensive rangeland systems are really important because clipping forage or monitoring forage is just really critical for evaluating how much is there in the, the composition. So you can see here a, an assortment of three different precision technologies, virtual fencing, and terror commissions monitoring, and real-time in pasture weighing. And this is at our historic uh, Cottonwood Field Station located in Rapid City, South Dakota, or by Rapid City, South Dakota. And so, uh, dissimilar to the eastern systems that Dr. Jackson was talking about, grazing systems in general, especially if you go to western rangelands, lack infrastructure in terms of power, <laughs> roads, uh, communication, even if it's satellite or otherwise. And so, let's take this Texas ranch, and so I'm from the Houston area originally. And so, we may have a ranch that's about 230 acres, and there is an ability to have a, a hub and communication and maybe do these drones and data. And that's a lot more feasible on these type of systems because even 230 acres isn't that big compared to the gradient as we move north and west into the northern Great Plains or farther west. So here's this uh, 0.59 mile area. We're gonna outline it with yellow and just kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. So if you see the upper left-hand corner, this is overlaid proportionally to my research station below in this 2.41 area. So the average allotment size for a pasture is about 4,000 acres in the western South Dakota. Now we're gonna outline this in blue and take it one step further west. And you can see the proportion of this yellow and then blue squares on the upper left-hand corner of this photo. And then uh, the 6.84, and you can imagine how infrastructure deficient it is. And so the uh, transition of these dairy or poultry type, you know, really intensively confined monitoring systems has now evolved out towards extensive production systems, which has been really exciting for us in these areas. And this helps us tackle different challenges like topography. So these animals have to go out on extensive systems. Maybe they're walking up to seven kilometers a day and um, they have to go up and down hills and draws. And that's an energetic cost, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. There's also vastly different forage composition, species diversity. In that pasture I showed you, you could quickly identify 60 different grasses and forbs within those pastures. And that's changing relative to climatic conditions. And so not only do we have these dynamic conditions, the dif different pasture species community compositions and uh, nutrient composition like low CP or crude protein, palatability or high, high total digestible nutrient areas, which may be able to identify by drones like uh, Dr. Jackson was talking about. But also while our animals are being asked to go get this on these extensive systems, they're exposed to extreme heat. So we can get up to 114 degrees Fahrenheit and as low as negative 60 with wind chill. Um, and so it's just a very, uh, very big climate extreme. And so then the question is, well, this is challenging. What are the management interventions that we need to achieve this or ranch goals? And so I want to highlight goals here for a minute because it's really important. Is it animal production, reproduction? Is it rangeland health, rangeland production? Is it wildlife or all of them or a combination? And so that's really important as we move forward in this talk. So our current university president, President Barry Dunn, is a rancher from this area, was in times past. And he wrote this paper, the two best and two worst decisions he's ever made. And looking back, you can kind of see <laughs> what those are. And so one of the key takeaways from this rangeland symposium paper was that he tried to do a lot of cutting edge in around 2003 innovative solutions simultaneously. And with precision livestock technology, as you've seen, it's like, oh my goodness, there's a ton of different option models, drones, uh, robotic infrastructure. That's really cool, but we may need to evaluate which one is the highest leverage for, again, your production goal or your range on health goal. Let's put it in another way. Here's a rancher and he's kicking down a problem. Oh, look, he already has virtual fencing collars on his cattle. That's amazing. And he's going to do genetics, Internet of Things, satellite remote sensing, drones, uh, AI, deep learning, uh, camera based systems and data analytics. Wow. And we don't know the 
intended or unintended consequences of implementing one or multiple strategies simultaneously. And so I just want you to give pause to how we need to evaluate these different implementation of precision technology. So he could, it could work out good, or look at this, there's a bunch of zeros and ones on that last domino. So not only is he gonna get potentially crushed, but he's gonna have a headache from all the data he has to process in Excel or maybe program R, who knows. On top of that, and this is a picture of our, uh, my colleague, Dr. Amanda Blair, who's a meat scientist and rancher in Western South Dakota, Blair Brother Ranch. And she always reminds our team, hey, if these interventions don't maintain or improve meat quality and beef productivity, they don't matter. And so our team makes sure to, eva make sure to evaluate those aspects as well relative to these management interventions. So let's jump right into one of the more popular management interventions that's kind of the uh, disruptive technology of rangeland, and that's virtual fencing systems. So in that middle video, you can see my student, uh, Eli, Elias Moreno, installing a virtual fencing collar. It takes about 30 seconds to two minutes on average. There's a base station component which relays up to 16 different pasture boundaries to these animals. And so you can see an older version of that cattle rider, that gray box on the animal. This allows you to draw virtual fence boundaries. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that here in a minute and animals respond to a shock or sound, sound stimulus. So here's our pasture one, a cattle, and they, this is in last year in 2023, and they're actually, actually this is 2022, and here's a real-time heat map of a five minute GPS fix for where those cattle are in real time. Again, this is old data, but this is the type of data you can get on top of the control of those cattle with digitizing these boundaries. So you may be wondering, what are these red and white boundaries? The red is the shock zone and the white is the sound zone. And it's comparable to the shock and electric fence. And there are safety features built in for animal welfare concerns. This has allowed us to implement rotational grazing. We found it a very effective pivoting that rotation around a single water source. And so this will be our fourth year implementing rotational grazing using a virtual fencing system. And so here's just another view of the effectiveness or do animals stay within those virtual fencing areas? And the answer in general is yes. And collar retention has improved in terms of those collars staying on those animals. So these dots just represent the points of actual counts. And there is ability to recapture those animals. When they go to water, they're, they're allowed in, but not out. So one last thing to wrap up virtual fencing is this is part of our long-term studies. So we have six different pastures. Again, this will be our fourth year of implementing this technology. And we have found in general, there's no differences in performance, grazing behavior, or even kind of a cherry on top was we we're able to calculate energetic expenditure. If you remember that one of those earlier slides I showed you of the energetic cost, well, with this technology, we can actually put it into nutrition models, which is a, a pretty cool uh, added benefit. Also, there's huge management implications in terms of real-time tracking. So this image to the left with the blue cattle, I took that yesterday of our pasture th uh, 11 and 10, and uh, those are heifers. And so I can say, oh, where are my cattle? And you can imagine a rancher on a 4,000 acre allotment or a 30,000 acre allotment can likely and have been able to use this to locate their cattle and greatly decrease that time to gather those cattle up on these extensive systems. We can also protect riparian areas and do targeted grazing. So at this point, you may be thinking, well, that's really neat, but what does it mean for me and my, my consumers? And so let's dive into a case study here of return on investment. So we could get really excited about a technology. So walk with me here through this causal loop or how everything's connected. So there's an investment in precision technology. We decide, the rancher decides to use it, expecting these benefits, hoping for return on investment. Does it pay out? And so we did a study in 2021 to evaluate this. So we talked about the, the growing season. Now let's go into the dormant season. And so with this study, again, to orient you, we're in Western South Dakota at the Cottonwood Field Station. And the question was, well, do we only evaluate low input forage based systems versus feeding in a dry lot or, or supplementing in a dry lot? And the literature supports that utilizing low input forage based systems generally will save you money. 
But these dormant grasses generally lack nutrients like crude protein and energy. And so that requires a supplement, especially for developing heifers, which we want to reach 60 to 65% of mature body weight. So we did a control group and a precision group. All the animals were fed or offered at least five pounds per head per day. And so these were done with 60 black Angus heifers. And they were also monitored for uh, real-time body weight using a precision infield scale at the water source. So for the results, we did find a difference in terms of the total supplement intake per head. And it was lower for the precision group and saved on average about $28 per head. Further, in terms of the target body weight of that 60 to 65 percent or 840 pounds, there was a tighter grouping around the precision group compared to the control. And we evaluated pregnancy rates, and while not statistically different, there's a 16% difference in pregnancy rates, which is significant in, in my mind or for a rancher. And we've continued to uh, conduct this study uh, since that 2021, but I'm not going over those results today, but continuing to evaluate differences in pregnancy rates. And so with that, we've covered the blue loop, which is this return on investment loop, but we had to ask, well, there's also maintenance of the technology. So Dr. Jackson, was he ended with that really nice slide of cost of the drones. What's the cost of the technology? How much is the upkeep for subscriptions and services, et cetera? And we really have to weigh that out uh, when deciding on these different technologies. This doesn't matter if it's supplements, a green feed pasture unit, precision weighing, or virtual fencing, or any combination or, or single use of precision technologies we have to uh, evaluate this return. And so it gets down to that kind of Jerry Maguire quote, show me the money, right? And this is what the rancher's asking. And that starts with the profit center of our cattle herd. And we have to consider the fixed and variable cost and the opportunity cost relative to these different precision technologies. And we can just see how many things there are to consider. Here's just another slide emphasizing that. And so, different fixed variable cost depreciation for those non-cash expenses. And then you can see Dr. Brennan here in this lower right-hand panel. And you know what's the cost of putting on virtual collars versus just releasing those cattle into the field? There's always an opportunity cost. And so we did a small case study on the financial evaluation of these different precision technologies. And so with the same feeding system from that trial that I just told you about a few slides ago, we asked the question, okay, well, what if we change the number of head and it's 30, 30 heads, so this is from that actual data, and with a complete financial evaluation, we can see that the payback period is 147 years. But if we increase that number of head per year to 240 animals, and it scales the number of machines required proportionally, so don't worry about that, the payback period is about 2.8 years. And so considering the different financial implications relative to those production goals and your potential management strategies, and you can see here management value per year, we're paying a manager $60,000 a year to fill this feeder. It may look a lot different than it does if it's lower cost labor. So all those factors are built into this tool. And so just to wrap things up here, I've given you the first two loops. So you can see this loop outlined in blue, which is a return on investment loop, the loop within here. And again, this is a systems approach. So just to orient you to that is this, what are the unintended costs that may slow your adoption or the ability to adopt or maintain these technology? And so these two loops on the outside or on the inside, um, determine those those return on investment or the maintenance costs. On the left hand side, we can see that number of ranching experts, rural youth, this really represents, well, who's going to run it? <laughs> Is there an army of technical service providers trained in this precision technology to enable ranchers to use the technology and to support the maintenance? Because it's a lot of maintenance and there's a cost to that as well. Or on the right hand side, like uh, the other professors we're talking about here, or doctors, excuse me, um, it's the speed of innovation. So all these drones and models and, and imaging, they're rapidly evolving. And we have to account for the updates and upgrades and new equipment and new learning curves 
relative to these precision technologies. But don't worry, I hope you have a little anxiety from this. There's hope. So we put together five steps which align with almost any business strategy. It's what's the problem? What are you actually trying to, let's not have a hammer and look for nails, right? What tools can gather the data you need, whether that's support tools and apps and models and precision measurement equipment or virtual fencing or precision supplementation? How can you operationalize that? And then also finally, always evaluate your impact to see if you're actually having an effect on a, a shrinking that performance gap. So that I'd like to thank you for your time, the privilege of speaking to everyone today, and I'll hand it back over to our host. Thank you.